Spanish, Spanish misfortune, misfortune. Mm -hmm. and the lark in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't do any work on lark in the morning. Yeah. Uh, you you played it once, and then you said we we're going to work on it this week. Oh, good. Okay, well, mm -hmm. we'll work on that one, and mm -hmm. uh, and we'll warm up with Spanish, uh, okay. and then, uh, and then we'll open it up, and we'll just work on whatever people want to work on. It's always good to just play the stuff. I call it taking the grinder to it. So <laughs> now with the orchestra, sometimes I do what I call speed trials, uh, which is where we, because uh, there's a lot of them, and some of them are getting pretty up there with the speed. So what we do is we we take the sets that whatever we're working on, and we do what I call, we determine uh, uh, aspirational tempo and uh, practicing tempo. So basically, we practice at a tempo where everybody can definitely do it. You know, no questions about it. And then uh, and then we try to push it. And uh, and I usually push it too far. Uh, and then that shows up what people are having trouble with. So if we get to, say, 100 or 95 uh, with, the two, with a set of tunes, then uh, I, we will do it at that tempo or whatever. And then I'll kind of get a get a. Uh, an assessment of who's struggling and who where who's it easy for uh and so then with that's kind of the aspirational so people are kind of like i just tell them practice it at say 85 and then twice this week try it up at the 95 see what goes wrong you know and then we've been able to move everything up steadily up as we go along using that method uh so uh it's really useful so anyway so we'll do a bit of that taking the grinder to it. So let's start with Spanish. And that means that we've got to practice a D major scale. So that's what we're going to do first. Oh, my tuner crashed. All right. Now, let's see if I'm in tune. Oh, negative original sound. There we go. Okay, D major scale and arpeggio with the best sound you've ever made in your life. Let's do it. A one, two, three, go. the arpeggio. Ready, go. Now, mine was not bad, but it certainly was not perfect. Uh, there was two notes on the scale that were out, and then on the arpeggio I had two that I had to fix. Uh, did you guys hear them? No? <laughs> Let's do it again. It, it wouldn't be very gentlemanly of us to say if we did. <laughs> Good bad yourself, David. Okay, let's do this again. One more time. Better this time. A one, two, three, go.
Arpeggio. Much better. I played a perfect game there, I think. How'd you guys do? Pretty good? Oh, good. We're going to up the speed then. <laughs> so a little bit quicker. Scale of an arpeggio. Hey, Rick. So we'll do it like this. Like, uh, I'm going to mute you there, Rick, before I forget. Oh, sorry. I muted you. <laughs> so uh, what key are we in? D. We're doing the D major scale on arpeggio. So it's going to be like this. Okay, see if we can keep her in tune. A one, two, three, go. good it wasn't too bad how was yours at that tempo was it all right okay good let's do it again then try to do exactly the same thing exactly the same except better of course much better one two three go How did you guys do? All right? Hopefully. Good. Start of Midland, I'd think. Good, good, good. And you know, it's always important to just kind of try to uh, be mindful every time you do it. That's why we do scale snare arpeggios. First of all, because tunes are made of scale, scale snare arpeggios. Um, and also uh, because it gives you a chance to try to see where your tendencies are. That's the biggest thing. Some people tend to the sharp. Other people tend to the flat, most people. Uh, and uh, it just gives you a chance to see where you tend. And then you can make a, a change. Okay. Ben, yes. Okay. Um, just on that subject of, yes. you know, going straight and things like that. Oh, yeah. um, you spoke a little bit last week about... Uh, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, the double stops, yeah, oh yeah, sort of thing. Okay, with the with that movement. Okay, yeah, we're we gonna do some of that this week too. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that with the arpeggio double stops. We're gonna go hand, 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 arm, arm, hand, 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 arm, arm on a double stop. Good idea, David. And then once we do that, maybe we'll do some jig rhythm on the double stops. Since we're doing uh, Banish Misfortune. But first, let's do that. Let's do uh, hand, 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 arm, arm with the G major double, or D major double stops. Okay, ready, 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 go.
such a good exercise. And I was really trying as I went along there to notice my hand and see how much I was able to actually move it. I'm always trying to make that bigger, okay? Because this is my main bow arm here. So I'm always trying to get a bigger spread out of it. So when I do that exercise, when I'm doing that exercise with people, that's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking, how much more can I get? And the up bow. The up bow is the one that everybody has so much trouble with. So most people can do the down bow, but when they do the up bow, it goes up like that. See that for some reason. So the up bow is really good. Like a, when I'm finished my up bow, I look like that. Unfortunately, I can't stick that finger out. I could probably get a couple more centimeters if I could stick that finger out. But if I did, I would lose all my bear down ability on the bow because when you have a straight finger, she slips, which means two efforts to bear down on the bow. Not enough time for that. So you have to always keep that finger solidly around the bow. See that? So even at the top of my up bow, I still have to have that finger there. If I didn't, I could probably get a couple, <laughs> half a centimeter more out of her, and I would if I could. Okay, let's do it again, and then I want feedback. Okay, a one, two, three, go. exercise or basically any time I'm playing on the D string the D string is where I seem to uh, uh, like kind of grind in a little bit too much sometimes uh, which actually actually makes it so that you can't really hear it now where I notice that is when I'm playing in bars because they're so loud and I find that the first thing that gets lost to my ear is that D string I don't know what it is. Now, I think, I have a feeling, and I was just doing it just now, I was feeling that D string, and I was like, if I can just stay nice and loose on my approach to the D string, I can drag the bow along it and not choke it off. Uh, but if I push on it at all, she's going to choke off. And even if it's slightly, it's such a reduction in volume. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's that was my feedback for what I just did trying to get a nice drag on that D string the D string is the bugger for me now how about you guys Paul what's your thoughts and feelings about hand bowing on the double stops well I mean it's funny you should mention the D string because I I actually find my problem with the D I also have a big problem with the D string and my problem is is I end up bumping into the other strings when I play ah. the D string Right. That's because and, the D string, unlike all the other strings on the fiddle, has fat neighbors. Right. And it's itself loose. It's, a, it's the yeah. lowest tension string that's surrounded by strings. Because, I mean, right. the D string is probably lower tension, I'm guessing, because it's, but it's not surrounded on both sides. So it's, it's, it's easy. If you really grind into the D string, it's you're like, you can just overcompensate, right? And, and, oh, yeah. and, move your bow away from but it's not right off of it. yeah, yeah so. let me give you the lowdown though it's interesting you say that you say that about the tension uh the e string has more tension down on the fiddle down on the bridge than all the other strings put together right it's the yeah. tightest string on the fiddle it is yeah. just tearing down there also the other thing about it is that when you look at it it's a drop the e string is a drop see that it's like mm -hmm goes right down there on the bridge. Mm -hmm. 
The bridge yeah. kind of takes a drastic turn down for the E. So it's really easy to play on the E without touching its neighbors. Really, really mm -hmm. easy. Even easier than the G. Because with the G, it's the same thing. It's on, it's on it's sitting on the aisle, as it were. Uh, so you can just rock the bow right over, right? But that means that you're doing this kind of staying alive thing. Yeah. See that? And it's not easy. It's not the easiest thing. So so the, the E string is actually the easiest one to play without touching any others because of its position. is lower down there. See that? Then that makes the A string easy to play without touching the others too because the E string is kind of like well out of its way. See that? Yeah. So the D string is definitely the biggest danger and the biggest danger is when you put your third finger on it because it is now almost down at the level of the other two strings. Uh. Now, those are the dangers. The prescription is a steady right elbow, first of all. If that elbow moves at all while you're playing on the D string, even a tiny bit means a string change. See that? Mm -hmm. Even a tiny bit. So you got to keep that elbow steady and do your string change in here. Now, have I ever showed you guys this exercise, which I find really, really good? Oh, first of all, playing double stops is the best way to avoid playing double stops. <laughs> because you learn where that other string is. See that? You'll learn when you're doing this with your bow, you'll learn how far is too far very quickly. So, and the, a really good way to do it is, I don't know if I showed you guys this, but the way they taught us in Suzuki to do double stops, down bow on the G, move your hand till you're touching the D as well, and keep going. And no more. See what I mean? Same thing going the other way. There she is. See that? You learn that. You learn where the rung of that ladder is, and you, your foot stops wondering. Okay. So that's first of all, I find the best way to avoid them. Also, this little trick. So that's down on the G, up on the A. No arm, no elbow, just hand, and no sound on the D string. See that? You'll learn to roll the bow over without dragging it over. See that? By the time you do a bit of that, first of all, your string changing is going to be much easier, uh, better and easier and quicker. And also, you're really going to learn where those strings are and you're going to, uh, going to bump into them a lot less. Okay? So I call that down on the G, up on the A. Down on the D, up on the E, with no sound on that A or the D. And then also going the other way, up on the E, down on the, like. See that? So just opposite. Okay, that's the two really good exercises to control your string crossing and get better at it. Okay, how about you, Sandy? What is, where, what is your feedback about what you just tried to do? My tendency is to lift my elbow uh, on the up bow, and I've really got to try and control that because I end up putting more pressure. If I'm doing D and A together, I end up putting more pressure on D, so D sounds louder than A on my upstroke. Yeah, it's a very good point because the elbow's dragging it in. And uh, now, the, uh, did I ever tell you guys about the doorway? Okay, my brother Sean made us play in the doorway, and I don't know if it was... Uh, just torture because he was my older brother, but I think it was useful. <laughs> anyway, this is the doorway. See that? So this is the door jam. And you play with your elbow just in front of it. So now, if I go up and down with my elbow, I get a rub. See that? Or even better, if I use my elbow to bow, I get a bump. And, it, and usually for most people, the right arm just melts. Oh, and that's the perfect way to do it. See that? Now, when you do, that's called an isolation exercise. When you're trying to isolate part of your arm to not move. It's important when you do isolation exercises to not reach out for it and stick your elbow to it. Just sit, like my dad used to say, as if you were normal. <laughs> 
and uh, have your elbow just there kind of hanging around it and touching it so that if you do start to do this you'll get that signal because it's really hard to work on your right arm you can't see it while you're playing there's it, it kind of does its own thing it's really so that's a really good way to do it there is to play it in the doorway and it, he had us doing it for for a good couple of years when we first started okay immobilizing the right elbow and that's more more of what Paul was saying there too eh okay now how about you Rick what's your feedback about doing hand bowing on double stops um. I don't have a lot of trouble with it. It, it. I need to work on, everybody needs to work on the wrist, you know. Um, I practice double stops by doing really bad run pony uh, country lead-ins because they always start out with double stops, right? And it gets you, it gets you, it gets you doing it better because you can do it like a third or a fifth or do it in all different keys. And I, 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 I know you shouldn't start a Irish fiddle song with that, but it just gets, it helps you with my double stops, that's all. Oh, it's excellent. I, that's why I really got good at it, was playing in bars, doing mostly country, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And I got sets of double stops that I do for songs that, that I love. And I swear to God, one of these nights I'm going to get them all in tune. I swear to God, one of these nights. So that's what I always tell people. It's like, oh, I get bored playing Sonny's Dream over and over. And it's like, try playing it in tune. You'll never be bored again. Anyway, so this is it. <laughs> So in the key of G, Sonny's Dream. Sonny's Dream there, you hear the melody? Yeah. So, and that's my set. I can do it in a bunch of different keys. And uh, that's, so like, it's a, such a great way to practice them. It's still the way I always practice them. And I'm always trying to get different combos. This is my recent one. See that? That's a B and a G sharp together in the key of A. And then I'm going to play my big A. See that? That's a new one. <laughs> So, excellent way to work on double stops. Excellent way to do it. Especially if you listen to Johnny Cash's Fatal Player. I treat it like, uh, I treat it like uh, um, shit, inversions on the piano, the same kind of thing. They're just it's exactly the same thing. It's ex it, that is what it is, indeed. Yeah. Very good. How about you, David? What's your feedback about these double stops? <laughs> okay, well... Uh, yeah, that's what I did when I was muted. Um, uh, double stops. Okay. Um, the thing I'm having to do, which is new for me because I don't normally do this, is when I'm playing, I'm having to really watch this area right here with my eyes. Okay, like I'd, I'd much rather be able to play just looking away kind of thing, but I find with the double stops I can't because if I do, then the bow's gonna, you know, bow's gonna do that. So, uh, you know, it's really a. You know what I think there, David? I have a feeling I know what's going on if that's the case. Because you're right, you just shouldn't have to look. You should be able to do it by the feel and the sound. Okay, and what it is, I have a feeling, is that you're putting on the brakes. A lot of people put the brakes on when they start to approach that other string. And when you put the brakes on, it's like driving on the ice. That's when you start to go awry. See what I mean? Especially if it's a hesitating bow. It'll really start to move around on you. So what I suggest is... Uh, making sure you're moving the bow straight anyway, you know, before you try doing double stops. Take a look in the mirror or something while you're playing and make sure the bow is indeed moving straight. And if it is, you're going to just put the gas on. Do what the kids call fake it till you make it. Isn't that right, Paul? Isn't that what the young people say? Fake it till you make it. So pretend you can do it until it starts working. You know what I mean? Uh, because it's all about confidence. That particular thing putting the brakes on with the bow because of whatever you're encountering is all about confidence. You can fake your way through it. 
like you'll really see that when we start Lark in the morning, um, the C section especially, uh, because I'm uh, there's a, there's a grace note halfway through between the two triplets, yeah, and it it's like six times it happens, and I always put the brakes on before I hit that grace note, and so it comes out like ah. da, 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 da. yes, oh classic. Okay, here's what you're going to do about that. Instead of putting the brakes on, you're going to put the gas on. When you get the instinct to put the brakes on, floor it. Floor the gas. Did I ever tell you guys about the Newfoundlanders and the Skidoos? Okay, have you ever heard of something called water skipping? It's a ridiculous activity that people on the East Coast take part in, usually after having a lot of beers. And it is where, so it's a springtime activity where the lake out behind where you live is partially frozen, okay? And you and your buddies are going to have, you know, dare each other to go out onto the ice and go zooming onto the ice until you hit that open patch of water. And if you're going at just the right speed and without hesitation, you're going to hit that patch of water and you're going to skip across it. And send up a big rooster tail of water behind you. And all the boys go, yeah! Right? Now, if Sorry, that's you on don't... Skis or what are you on when you're doing that? Skidoo. On a, on a skidoo? On a skidoo. Oh. Yes, indeed. <laughs> now, I've never done it. But I've seen it. And I've heard a lot of renditions of water skipping. And my oh, favorite you one... A, huh? you make a mistake, you only do it once. That's right. Well, the boys are incredibly adept at pulling machines out of the water in the summertime and getting them running again. It always starts with always starts with hold my beer while I. Oh, hold my beer is definitely in there. Hold my beer is absolutely in there. So my favorite story about water skipping though was Laurie Wartman when I was working in in Halifax at Heritage Nissan, and he was a Newfoundlander, and he was talking about water skipping, and he said after my 18th beer, I thought I could do it. But then, when I just before I hit the water, the only thought was too fast, and he went down into the drink. <laughs> anyway, as it pertains to the bow, if those guys are going along, if they lose their nerve at all with the throttle, right, they're going to hit the water without the right speed, and they're going to go down, okay, or too fast. But usually, it's too slow. And so, what they do is. They tape their throttles open with duct tape so that it's always full gas. Okay? That's how I play the fiddle. I got my throttle duct tape open. I do not put on the brakes. I've removed the brake pedal from my bow altogether, and it's only gas. Okay? That's how I deal with that. So when you got your grace note coming, when you have the instinct, oh, I got a grace note coming, speed your bow up. Try to get into the habit of speeding your bow up. It's even better if you speed your bow up before the ornament. I'm just looking at the music for Lark in the Morning and, okay, speed the bow up before the ornament. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come. Oh, to that. I think you'll be able to do it. And it's, it's like you said, it happened six times. So it'll probably, you'll have a successful attempt at it probably the fifth time or maybe the sixth time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then next time we practice it, hopefully it's the third time. Okay. This, Dan, this may be kind of stupid. But I, I don't know nobody else does this, but when I'm trying to learn a song or work on a song, I go in the bathroom and turn on the light. I play in the dark. Try not to look at anything. Can't look. Yeah. Yeah, and you and you the only thing you hear is the sound. And you tend to get I tend to get better when I have oh, no yeah. distractions. And so I don't know. It, it, sometimes it helps you pick up the little nuances and stuff. So I like playing. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, I I I ninety percent of the time play with my eyes closed. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't really aware of that until somebody was telling me about that. And then, and, and now I'm well aware because I look at videos of myself and 90% of the time I have my eyes shut. And one time I was playing up in Cape Breton and Iona with my brother and it was a great crowd in the bar. They were having a great time. And one couple decided to stay the night in the hotel because of the show. Uh, and uh, I got finished. And somebody posted on my Facebook, they sent me a message that said, that was the worst fiddle playing I ever heard, and how come you're asleep the whole time? 
<laughs> and I knew that he actually liked you because otherwise he wouldn't have taken the time to write me a message, you know? Exactly. To which you responded. I didn't respond at all. <laughs> oh, you didn't respond at all. Oh, no, no. I'm not going to respond. The guy's just being cranky. Anyway, okay, so that was the double stops. Now that, now that we've talked about it, let's do it one more time, and then we're going to get into the jigs, okay? Oh, let's do it with jig rhythm. It's the same idea, just in 6-8, so watch this. Oh, whoops. each set of double stops. Let's give it a go. Here we go. One, two, three, go. People get along with that. So we do it again? Let's do it again right away. Same thing. Ready? Go. Good, and we'll up the speed and try to get better at that too. All right, let's banish misfortune. I'm finished with misfortune. It's out of here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now can anybody give me any idea? How fast we were doing it the last time. Any remembrance? Seems to me you said to aim for 105. Sounds like something I would say. Uh, it's going to be... And the only way I could hit 105 with it was to leave out all the rolls. Oh, um, yeah. That's pretty quick. Let's try it down at 95. Okay. Which is going to be... Dee -dee 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 and that's such a nice... I love that. That's the stately pace. And I think they're just... I think it's just great. Let's give it a go. One, two, three...
again. How was it? Everybody looked like they were happily sawing away there, not without it much difficulty, but uh, anybody having any trouble at that speed? Okay, up she goes, a little bit faster. Okay, so... Yep. How's everybody now? Rolls in. Worked. They worked? Well, it's a big butt. Now, I've got a big butt, so it fits. So <laughs> anyway, uh, the big butt is the uh, the C major roll, the beginning of the last line. Uh, C. I do it with two bows. I know I'm supposed to do it with one, but I do it with two. Well, just, you know, make a goal of doing it with one at least once or twice. But I'm going to tell you something. C-roll is a bugger. And uh, there's a couple of problems with the C-roll. Everybody complains about their C-roll, by the way. Both of them. So the one in the middle of the fiddle uh, on your A string is tricky because it's a low second finger roll. Low second finger rolls are some of the hardest rolls to do. And it's because as soon as you put your finger to the close position, if you do that, like if your hand is like this, right? And most fiddle players hand normally just kind of goes like this. <laughs> if you do that, as soon as you move your finger to the close position, do you feel the tension enter the middle of your hand? Even when you do it as gently as possible, there's no other way to do it, right? And so now that tension is there. And so also, the second finger is the longest one, obviously, right? And mine is really long. And so, and it doesn't like to pick up, right? It doesn't, it doesn't love it. The third finger really doesn't love it, but the second finger doesn't love it either. So to pick it up far enough is hard. I have to exaggerate it. Look at my hand when I do a C-roll. See how I'm picking up my first finger so that I can reduce tension on my hand. Okay, and I got my second finger there. And then as I do the roll motion, you see my first finger kind of reacts, but it doesn't make it all the way down to the string. So when I do a second finger roll, the, oh, the lower note is actually the open string. You hear that? 
And that's the way that I make it work, and most people do that, do it that way, tell you the truth. It's really, it's a difficult one, and that's why. Because I find it's a lot easier if you pick up this finger, it takes a lot of attention off your hand. The other C-roll that's hard, of course, is this one. Okay, and that's hard because it's on the low string, you got to get all the way over there. It's like they say it's the hardest roll on the fiddle, it's the C-roll on the G-string. And you also got to get your bow over there and you got to be gentle on that G string and I played this tune called Cronin's where I just you just finished playing a high G and then you got to go down and do a roll on the C and it's really it's fiddle players everywhere kind of like, are like oh god the C roll so that's what you're up against with that uh, I find exaggerating it does the job and perhaps picking up your first finger will as well Anybody else got any bits or pieces they want me to flesh out and talk about? Okay, let's do it again. Oh, yes, Paul. You're muted still. Oh, I can't hear you. What happened to you? You were there. Nope, can't hear you. Oh, you got the Bluetooth. Still not hearing you. No. Nothing. You mean now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I don't know what happened there, but can you still hear me? Yep. Okay. So um, my question was, so actually when you played it, you played it at the session last week and you played it, I think probably double that speed to be honest. Oh. So, but, but what I noticed is that I actually, um, the, I struggled with the first part, which was I thought like the one I had the, the, like the most kind of down pat, I struggled with that on the higher speed. And I think I worked out that what was throwing me off is that I was doing an up bow on the C in the first part, which is like on the on the beat that you kind of want to emphasize. And I just wondering, I'm like wondering if that's like if you try to do your bowing so that your 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 beat emphasis on the is on the down bow or an up bow, or do you just kind of like are there any kind of rules of thumb? Because yes. I know like one one of the rules of thumb that you actually mentioned a couple of classes ago, which was I thought was like very, actually very helpful for me was that every phrase try to make it consistent every phrase in terms of the bowing Yep. and start with like a down bow um and and that's kind of a good i find that that's helpful for me as a starting point but of that's course good. now and you have up bow anyway that's that's my question so okay very good question it's a two-part answer the first part is uh the the uh the, that is a good rule of thumb so so down bow down beat right that's the main thing we're always going for down bow down beat because down bow is our strongest note. It's we got gravity going for us. The bow moves straight. It's going to be strong. So down bow, down beat. Now, and bowing each phrase identical is really, really, really good. When you get into a jig, now we've talked about up-ups in a reel, right? We've talked about doing a, a, a slur in the up bow to, after a long note to correct your bowing pattern. Now, jigs are supposed to be more forgiving. You're supposed to be able to do the same thing on the down bow as you are on the up bow. See that? That's supposed to be kind of like identical. But, I don't know anybody where they're identical. Always, everybody's downity is much stronger than their uppity. No question about it. So, what you do is this. When, you, when you're playing a jig, and this is for jigs, when you're playing a jig, if, if you see a long note, a quarter note, followed by an eighth note in the latter half of the measure, you're going to play those in an up bow. And you're talking about the, we're talking about this tune, Vanish. Watch this. Yeah. I guess it's not, not really in there. No, because you're going down for that, so. So that's where it is there. The 
the, the, the F to the D. So that F up bow was, wait, F, was it F up bow that was screwing me? I thought it was like the C. Of I thought you were talking C. about the C too, but there's not really a problem with the C. <laughs> No, it's, I think it's the F. Okay, yeah. So you you did the F up bow, and you just connected to the next note. Yeah, so that's the thing that I'm talking about. The chord, the chord note okay. followed by an eighth note. You can, you can do them in, a, in an up bow, and then you're going down for that next phrase. Now, it's the jigs are a little bit different because it doesn't always work out like that. It's just okay. a general rule of thumb, and I can't emphasize enough. Only if it's on the latter half of the measure. Right. So beat four, five, six. That's if you see that figure in beat four, five, six, you can always up up them if mm -hmm. you're going up for it already. Okay. But like I said, jigs, you're supposed to make your uppity just as good as your downity. So see what I mean? Right, right. So we do a combo. I do a combo. Okay. okay so so you don't have to get yep. every. So sorry. So just to confirm, you don't have to make like it's not a hard rule that, that you're, you're, uh, you're, Downbeat is always down bow. Like sometimes you would do an up bow, but you just try as oh, much yeah. as you can. Okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like there's no rules. I mean, I, I wouldn't get into this music if there was rules. I hate it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So somebody tells me not to do something, I just want to do it right away. <laughs> so no, there are no rules, but that definitely makes it easier. So you know, easier. these okay. tricks that make it easier. It. And, that, and the, the jig up up, you'll get used to it. You'll start to recognize it. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. start to recognize when it's useful. Okay, got it. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Okay, one more banish. Okay, one, two, three.
Now you see I tried to do a fancy thing there in the middle and I screwed it up. <laughs> but you should always try, always try. How are people getting along now? Any better there, Paul? With the Boeing. Oh, lost you again. It's good? It's good. Okay, good. How's everybody else doing? Is it all right? Okay. So now, let's get out the Lark of the Morning. I sent it last time, I think. Everybody should have it. What does that like to do there? Okay. Let's see here. Lark. I'm going down to uh, Pennsylvania this summer in June to play the Celtic Fling. I uh, can't remember the name of the area, but I did it last year, and it was so funny. It was a, it was a uh, Renaissance Fair. Uh, you know, it, like it's it, it's called the Celtic Fling Festival, but it's held on the grounds of a Renaissance Fair, and everybody's a LARPer. Now, have you heard of LARPer? L live action role play is what they call it, and it's, it's these weirdos that dress up in fairy costumes and stuff like that, and spend the whole weekend with big ears. You know, it's things like that. There's strange people, but anyway, uh, I found it a lot of fun, and I was just I was just thinking it was all hilarious, and I sent a picture to my boy of a fully outfitted knight with full armor and a battle axe, and he's walking down the pathway with a Starbucks. And I thought that was pretty hilarious, you know? And he looked kind of hungover, too. Uh, and then, I, I don't know what happened to me. I must have got into the spirit of it, but it was, it was uh, or I was preparing for our, for Jennifer's birthday. That's what it was. And I got her this cloak. And I thought it would be great for camping and stuff like that. Like this, it's like this uh, this uh, linen cloak. And I I took it home and it's got a hood and everything. And I put it on her and she's like, "I'm not a larper." <laughs> so that was a complete bust. And I was like, "Well, I just thought it would be handy, you know, for camping." And she was like, "I guess I could keep it in the tent trailer." It's like, oh god, that was a bad one. And then before that. The, it was a Mother's Day gift I got her. It was a dress that Sylvie helped me pick out. And it was way too small for her. And uh, she went to put it on and she came out of the bathroom and said, I can't wear that sausage casing. Uh, and then uh, and then the next morning, <laughs> I'm walking Sylvia to school. And she goes, Dad, you got Mom fat shaming for Mother's Day. <laughs> She's a sharp one, boy. You gotta watch it around her. She loves to burn. Okay, lark in the morning. So again, I think I was talking about it last time. It's very simple. It's basically the same part over and over and over and over. So in the first, the, the A part, the main theme of the tune. <laughs> And then the ending, which is the same pretty well for all the parts. Okay, or the other ending is very similar. And that's it. That's the only endings that we have. So we have the main theme, which is kind of an arpeggiation, right? A, F, A, A, F, A, B, G, B, B, D, B. And so that's that part. And in the second part, it's scaly. See that? So that one's the scaly part. And then we got the part that's fancy that David was talking about with all the grace notes. And also 
also, you might notice that the middle phrase is very, very similar for all the parts as well. We don't have much to learn here, people. It's mostly just keeping it straight. And then the last part is kind of an arpeggiated part, but it's the upper. Instead of... We're going... getting the idea? <laughs> Here's what I suggest. Let's play the last two bars of the A part. Let's do that a good couple of times. The last two bars of the A part. Nice and easy. Ready, go. Do it again. Ready, go. And of course, that last triplet, the BDB, screaming out for a roll. All it needs is the lower note, and it is a roll. Okay, do it again. Ready, go. I rolled it. One more time. Ready, go. Okay. Now, let's practice now the last two bars of uh, the uh, third part. Wait, no, the, the second part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, so the last two bars of the fourth line. And you can do rolls on those notes if you want. Ready, go. Little trickier. Do it again. Ready, go. One more time. Ready, go. Okay, so now we've got our two endings sorted out. Should be pretty easy. Let's just try it from the top and see what happens. We'll go slow. Not in a hurry. Ready, go.
leave it hanging in tune. You gotta go back and play the first beat again to finish it. All right, how, is, how did everybody get along with the lark in the morning? Any problemos? I learned it a little differently years ago. I learned that uh, the last three notes, I would, I would, I would be B, C sharp, D, and then on a D. It's, it's fairly similar. So. Oh, yeah. I've heard that before. Sounds all right. Yeah, and you can go back and forth. You can do this one. You can do that one. You can do the roll. And uh, it makes it a little bit... The It's good to have options with this tune because it gets very repetitive, eh? Right. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else have any uh, insight? No? Well, I don't know we're going to get an insight. What's that there, no, David? Go ahead, Richard. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm just saying, um, I listened to a bunch of people play this on YouTube. It seems smoother than I'm playing it. I, I, I still feel like I'm, I'm sawing at it. I don't know. It's jig rhythm. It's, it's something that people struggle with. And uh, so, like I, I've explained it before, probably, but maybe not. So, downity, uppity. Downity, uppity, downity, uppity. You see that? And you see how, first of all, that's what we were working on with the double stops earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So, hand, hand, arm, arm, hand, hand, arm, hand, hand. Uh, 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 uh. And my arm is like a pendulum there. Yeah. No, I, I realize that's what I'm doing wrong. I know I'm using too much arm all the time. I got to work on that. I'll work on it. Okay. And the best thing to do is to concentrate on those downbeats. And try to make the other two notes happen as a result of it. Okay. Okay. See that? The up one is the hardest one. The uppity. What were you going to say, David? Uh, does the name Pete Cooper mean anything to you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I've got Pete Cooper's version of that. Mm-hmm. And the Boeing is like from another planet. I don't know. But it's uh, it's what it's what I'm trying to work on with this, and uh, lots of over the bar line slurs. Uh, yeah, it's got oh, it's got bar line slurs. It's got uh, you know just about everything you can think of. Uh, I don't know why uh, some people play this and they don't have anything in there at all. Oh, you don't have to. You know, you can do you can play this tune almost completely straight down to the uppity. Uh, without any weird things at all, almost. Now, the over the bar line slurs are awesome. Watch this. <laughs> See that? It brings a lot of life to it, like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a Kevin Burke thing, eh? It's what Kevin Burke used to do. Uh, now, the thing is about it is that unless you get your downity and uppity really good, the, those over-the-bar line slurs are going to confuse the arm like you wouldn't believe. Uh, so it's good to have a good foundation of downity uppity uh, before you start messing with it. You know what I mean? But definitely, I encourage you to, to go ahead and do those over-the-bar line slurs, but always remember you're coming back to that downity uppity simple, simple pattern. Okay? Good point, though. Anybody else? How about you, Paul? Anything to share, or we just want to get? Yeah, to well, I mean, so, so, so on that note, so you know, taking the formula of trying to get every phrase starting with a down bow and minimizing the amount of slurs, like I, I did, I do two things really, um, and and the the two things I do is I do an over the bar line slur from the A to the B at the beginning of the B part, right? So be great. is that fine? It is yeah. great. Okay. It is really good because you can't slur. Now, that trick I was telling you about does not apply on that bar because it's right. their both A's, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, it's the best thing to do. Okay. 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 And then the okay. other thing to, to yeah. get the down bow, um, the other spot is to add, I'm trying to. Um, oh yeah, the beginning of the C part to add a grace note with the F, right? F sharp. Right? Perfect. That's fine? Okay. Oh, it's really good. I do it every time almost. 
Now, that, the other thing to point out about that in a jig is that that grace note, you can slur it or not slur it. And I often say it's kind of the difference between Scottish and Irish. Listen to this. That's the Irish style, you know, big long ups with the grace note in the middle. And the Scotchy style. See that? All I'm doing there is changing bow direction, but it makes me put a kilt on like you wouldn't believe. You notice that? <laughs> like it is very distinctive. So those, and that's a good, a good opportunity to look at it because you got many double Fs there, right? And you can right. do that to every one if you want. See, that's really nice to do, or you can alternate, which is kind of what I do. But I have special dispensation from Irish people because I'm Scottish and they know there's nothing I can do about it is what they say. So I'm allowed. <laughs> they don't mind when I do it. <laughs> okay, very good insights, very good points. Standy, you got anything to say or... It's it's just getting that fancy finger work you're doing there down on the um the double Fs. That's yeah. it looks like you're you're hitting F sharp and then reaching out for A, are you? Or are you doing Yeah, I now that's a grace note. And uh I use my third finger. It's kind it's kind of half and half the people that use their and it's for the first finger, right? Like for an F for an F, I use the third finger to do a grace note. Some people use the second. And I heard Kevin Burke talking in a workshop once, and he was like, the people that I know, it's half and half. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it really depends. On, I love the third finger because it really smacks. Yeah. And also, I'm double jointed with my third finger. And look mm -hmm. what happens. When I pull it back, it does a piano hammer thing. See that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And so that can really smack. I use it. I, I just like that. I use it every time. See that? So uh, that's that's why I use my third. But you should experiment and see which finger reacts to a grace note wants to. Okay. And it doesn't matter what key you're in because when you do a grace note, you, you don't need to hear the pitch of the grace note. You just need to hear the interruption of the note you're doing. Yep. Okay. Okay. Very good point. Okay, let's try it again. Okay. A one, two, three. <laughs>
breather and we're going to go faster because everybody looked like they were very happy. And, you know, I hate to see that. So we're going to have to do it faster and more challenging to make people start grimacing instead of being so happy. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about uh, that those grace notes and the difference between the Irish ones and the Scottish ones. And it made me think of the way that my dad used to wake me up when I was a kid. He had he he constantly he could not stop gagging all the time. He was constantly coming up with gags. So he had two ways of waking us up that he loved to do. The first one was like the Irish grace note. He would take usually a bow hair, because it was usually hanging around, and dangle it over my face until I started smacking myself because I thought it was a fly. And uh, then I would open my eyes and he's standing there with the bow hair laughing and laughing. And that's it was very gentle and very kind of, you know way to wake up. The other way he would wake us up, especially on the weekends when he wanted us working, was to reach under the covers and grab the two toes and pull them apart very fast. And that's more like the Scottish uh, uh, grace note. It's sharp, it's fast, and it hurts a little bit. Uh, so anyway, those are the two kinds. <laughs> See if you can envision that while you're trying to play them, you know? The two kinds of ways to wake up. And then my mom used to wake us up in the summer times because, uh, uh, you know, my dad would be gone. And, and she'd wake us up and she'd call us, first of all, gomics. And I don't know if you've ever heard of a gomic, but it's a Gaelic word. And I didn't know what it meant until I was an adult. And I went to Scotland and somebody said it was laughing when I told them that she, they called a, she called us gomics. Get, to, get up out of your bed, gomics! And, and the person told me, that it was because she's the person said she had 12 kids 10 of them boys and I said yeah and she goes that's funny because a gomic is a is a uh, uh, you know like a pejorative term for a male <laughs> so it makes a lot of sense you know what I mean yeah get up your gomics and then she would say next time I'm coming with the water and then she did <laughs> Okay, faster! <coughs> I've distracted you enough. One, two, three, go!
It's getting there. Getting there. Good, 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 good. So we got lots to work on for that for next time. And I, I would like to have just a grinder night where we play a bunch of tunes. But also, challenge. We're going to work on a slow air. Okay, maybe not next time, but the time after. And it's going to be fairly intense because I want to work on, with the slow air, I want to work on three aspects. Sound quality. Intonation. And rhythm. Okay, and in a slow air, it's even harder. Now, this is funny. I was teaching this girl this morning, Alice Fortune. It's her name. She's Irish. She's young. She's she's going to turn 30 next week. Do you remember that? Do you remember turning 30 next week? Wasn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and uh, but she's really she's coming along really quick. Now, her apparently her her parents play. And, like, it's a bit of a musical house that she grew up in. So today we were doing, She first of all, she figured out Black Velvet Band. Just by, I just gave her a starting point. And it's such a good exercise, eh? You, you take, I did it with my beginner class. You take a familiar song that you've been playing or singing, you know, you know to pieces, especially if you know the words, and you figure it out on the fiddle. And it's such a great exercise now she was talking about how she was trying to play the fields of Athen rye over christmas time and she was having a lot of trouble with it because she said it's she it was really interesting she was like it's almost harder to play a slow one because you gotta wait so long for the notes to go by and you don't know whether you've held them for long enough or whether you've cut them off or or what's going on and so you try to use the words in your head but then you you still don't hold it long enough and i was like absolutely and for instance in the fields of ath and rye d d d d d d what is it now da 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 to the free birds fly and when i'm holding that when i'm playing this tune downtown for the for the young irish people i'm holding that fly and i got to hold it for long enough for them to shout, hey, baby, let the free birds fly, which they do every time, right? And I said that to her, and she said, of course, I'm, I'm usually the first one screaming that. <laughs> but it's a great way to think about it, because you're playing it, you know, the free birds fly. IRA you know so it does actually help and and it is harder to play a slow one for that reason most people don't like the sound they're making so their bare bow barely moves most people are fine that they're playing flat so their bow barely moves because they don't want that flat sound to come out or be held and second of all, they can't bear to hold the long notes long enough because they're just too scared. So uh, those three aspects are really good to work on with slow airs. And what I make people do is make me a video. So we're going to pick a slow air, one that's familiar, maybe not one that you already know, but one that you know of. And we're going to work on it and we're going to make it sound as good as you can with those three aspects involved. And you're going to make me a video and send it. 
and then we're going to talk about those videos because I can't that's the one thing I can't do on zoom is improve your sound quality because the the uh, transmission adds a codec to the sound so I don't actually hear what you actually sound like uh, now I can kind of make some guesses because I've been using zoom for years now but the best way is to make a video and for most people just making the video makes you a stronger player just doing it okay and everybody that I've had doing it so far has got a lot stronger. So next week's going to be Jam Week. Think of tunes you want to just play. And then we're going to get a slow air on the go for the week after that. Okay? Great work, everybody. We'll see you next Monday. Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye.